27 when he died, okay? I didn't mean to take up all your sweet time. I gave it right back one of these days. I didn't mean to take up all your sweet time. I gave it right back one of these days. If I don't see you no more in this world. You on the next one and don't be late. How's it going? It's James here. Welcome to another video. Hope you're all getting ready for Christmas and uh, you'll have seen that clip there hopefully that I've cut in at the start of the video. That was uh, Glenn Tilbrook from uh, Squeeze, captured uh, live in fine form several so, years ago. So um, yeah this is a video about great but overlooked guitarists and uh, I'd say Glenn is certainly one of them. Um, the idea for this video came about just thinking about all the guitar players that people always talk about and you know it tends to be people you know the big people as you know Clapton as Hendrix um, I mean you know I mean you know all the big ones that people kind of talk about now the people I'm going to be talking about in this in this video they're not like you know massively obscure I'm sure there's going to be people out there who can come up with much more esoteric lists than this so these are guitarists who are not kind of completely overlooked or ignored but they are guitarists who possibly don't get as much of a look in you know as your Hendrixes and your Jeff Becks and your Clapton. Anyway so yes moving swiftly on so also we have um, now where is he now um, Robbie Robertson uh, from the band again a musician's musician he wasn't into kind of tearing off incredible guitar solos but he was he was really influential uh, you know the band uh, were influential in the 60s in fact, strangely enough, they were one of the reasons why Eric Clapton kind of turned his back on the heavy power trio format of Queen, of Queen Cream, and started doing uh, more kind of uh, you know uh, down the barn type uh, rustic rock and roll. But the stuff he played was always tasteful. It was always just just right. I love his playing on um, Planet Waves by Dylan. He does some great stuff on there. I think he was quite influential in later years for people like, maybe like, um, you know, Mark Rebo, Tom Waits' his guitarist. He just had that kind of slightly rattly, uh, primitive quality. He was really influenced by um, rockabilly, I think, as well as the blues. I mean, he was really into the chess bluesman, but he was, he was also, he was really heavy into rockabilly and all that kind of early American music. Great, great, great musician and obviously a you know, brilliant songwriter as well. Uh, another Robbie, uh, we have Robbie McIntosh from The Pretenders. I saw this guy play uh, with Paul McCartney back in the late 80s, 89, perhaps it was 1990. He was in McCartney's touring band for a while and a uh, great player. Uh, this album contains some great stuff. Um, the track Show Me by The Pretenders has always been a big favourite. He has this really wonderful uh, kind of chiming guitar sound in that song and all this lovely finger picking stuff which was just beautiful to listen to and he was he, you know he was a really versatile guitarist he could do anything when I saw him play with McCartney he did a great solo at the end of the song um, things we said today he used to take a solo spot at the end of that song and just do this incredible kind of fret burning stuff he's not a journeyman guitarist he's kind of more high profile than that but he's perhaps never really got the credit he deserves um, somebody else who again I would say falls into that category is Bill Nelson from Bebop Deluxe, somebody that I've been getting into this year. I've got a couple of albums by Bebop Deluxe now. I've got one solo album by him, which I need to show. I think he's a technician. I think he's he sounds to me like somebody who's really applied himself and learnt that the technical aspect of the guitar. He's one of these musicians. It sounds like um, nothing would phase him. You know, he'd be able to sit in with a jazz group. He'd be able to try his hand at classical guitar. He he just has that versatility. And um, what I love about him, he, he kind of launches into these amazing flights of fantasy in uh, 
bebop deluxe songs where all of a sudden you know the songs are all quite complex anyway but then he kind of throws in this extra thing which is this uh, amazing guitar solo which takes you off somewhere but it's never self-indulgent it's never virtuosic for the sake of it it's always uh, structured into the song it's always part of the song and um you know really just immense taste and um precision uh, but he's not kind of overly technical you know it's not it's not cold it's it's uh, it's always colorful and vibrant and just wonderful to listen to another guitarist who doesn't get as much attention as he deserves is the fantastic uh, Niall Rogers from Chic who um, you know I mean disco does not get a good press on the vinyl community but I think even the people who don't like disco are often forced to admit uh, that there is a level of um, musicianliness uh, to Sheik's music, which perhaps lifted it above the kind of common or garden disco. And, you know, Sheik were an amazing combination. Nile Rogers' guitar playing, to me, it sounds like it was a big influence on Prince. Uh, it has that kind of funky quality to it, but he could do the kind of stinging blues runs and just all kinds of things. And again, he was a songwriting guitarist, and there's something about a great guitar player who also writes songs because they can they can make the solo or they can make the guitar part just bleed seamlessly into the structure of the song in a way which is possibly more interesting uh, than just you know a guitar player who just takes a solo in a song and just goes off on one. <clears throat> Phil Manzanera from Roxy Music. Where is he? Oops. There he is. Again he falls into the category for me a bit like Bill Nelson you get the sense that he could do anything and Roxy Music were a really interesting band they did a lot of stuff with textures in the early days it was largely to do with Brian Eno but Phil Manzanera does some just does some incredible stuff on those Roxy albums and um, again you know perhaps not a household name I saw a video recently somebody on the VC I can't remember who it was uh, had got a Phil Manzanera album and you know, I hadn't even realised that he was from Roxy Music, which just kind of goes to show perhaps that he's, he doesn't quite have the profile of a David Gilmore. You know, uh, you know, everybody knows that Gilmore was in Pink Floyd. But Phil Manzanero maybe is, is not quite as much a household name, which is, um, which is kind of a shame, really, because I think his contribution to the band uh, was really significant. And even though they became more of a vehicle later on for Brian Ferry, I think Phil Manzanero, you know, he was with the band all the way along. And even if you get as far as the last album, Avalon, uh, his guitar playing is in there still. It's kind of taken on a more kind of yacht rock quality by them, but you know, it's in there. He was also, David Gilmore actually talking about Gilmore, Phil Manzanera helped David Gilmore on the album Momentary Lapse of Reason. He co-wrote the song, I think it was One Slip, and, me and maybe played some guitar on the record, I'm not entirely sure, but anyway, a bit of an unsung hero. The next two actually are probably the most unknown or the most uh, obscure kind of cult now I don't have any records by the Daruti column. This is the only record I have in my collection that features this guy, but the guitarist in question is, is Vinnie Riley. And he was in the band, the Daruti column, which were quite a, a kind of experimental band. They were into kind of ambient textures. It was him really, I mean, it was Vinnie Riley in all but name. Uh, but, the, but the performance I really love by him is on this album by um, Morrissey and the song um, Suede Head. You know, I mean, it wasn't an easy job you know, after the Smiths, to try and be the, be the guitar player for Morrissey. Obviously, you know, you've got Johnny Marr was one of the most significant and the most gifted players of the era. But if you listen to Swadehead, the guitar parts in that would would not shame uh, Johnny. I think he does some really great little finger picking stuff and very uh, lyrical, um, emotional guitar playing, which I think is great. And then another kind of cult name we have BC Gilbert or Bruce Gilbert from Wire uh, who was a conceptual artist I think and he he saw Wire as a, a kind of art project he was never very comfortable with the idea of them being a rock and roll band he was heavily into the blues but he wasn't into rock and roll music and he did a lot of work in Wire trying to get very very um, abrasive guitar textures but also very uh, kind of angular playing. He was not into excess. Everything was very pared down and wire just had that unique ability to make stuff sound um, as if it had been chiseled, you know, out of, out of a block of musical uh, stone, really, you know. 
and um, Bruce Gilbert is no longer in the band. Wire are continuing to this day, but they don't have him in in the lineup. And a little bit sacrilegious in a way because I, you know, I do think his sound was was kind of utterly uh, integral to the sound of Wire. Uh, but there we go, Bruce Gilbert, BC Gilbert from Wire, and from the same uh, era we have the fantastic unsung hero of um, British pop music, slightly alternative British pop music, and that is Dave Gregory from XTC. And uh, in fact, Dave Gregory and the next person I'm going to show, the last person I'm going to show are very similar, and I'll, I'll explain why in a minute. Dave Gregory was not a songwriter, he didn't write any songs at all, but when he came into XTC, he was able to um, bring some arranging talents into the band and he was able to apply a sense of structure and shape to the band's music. He was incredibly versatile and adaptable, he was always able to come up with just exactly the right tonal colour or the right kind of solo uh, to make the song, you know, to lift the song into another area. And um, even though some people, you know, lots of people do really rate the final album that uh, XTC did, David left the band by then. And um, I do think that they were a lesser outfit without him. You know, a bit like um, BC Gilbert and Wire. I think Dave Gregory's sound, or it's more accurate to say sounds, really, you know, he was, like I said, he was so colourful and versatile and he didn't just have one signature sound. He could basically take each song as a unique thing and just do something uh, really distinctive with it. One of the most sublime things he ever did was the guitar work he does in Making Plans for Nigel, which is, it's got that kind of itchy, scratchy, post-punk quality to it, but it's it's filtered through a pop sensibility because he was, he was great with melody as well. So he had that kind of attitude, but he also had a great sense of tunefulness. And to finish with, a very similar um, guitar player from a previous era. Sorry about the lens flower. And uh, I'm just going to show how kind of unsung he is, that he's, he's not even pictured on the album, you know. But I mean, Mick, Mick Ronson, also an arranger, and he, you know, he could write string parts, he could play keyboards, and he was a guitarist as well, and he was a fantastic guitarist. And he did so much to make Bowie's music what it was, I think. And, um, you know, there's that great shot of them on top of the pops where, you know, Bowie puts his arm around his shoulders. He just seems so integral to that band. But um, I wouldn't say he's been forgotten, but, you know, people talk about David Bowie and they talk about what a genius he was. And Mick Ronson's contribution is often overlooked. Of course, he, he, uh, he's also on um, the Lou Reed album Transformer as well. He plays guitar on that and does some great, great arranging work on that album too. So, um yeah, not, perhaps not somebody who, oh here we go, let's get some pictures sorted out, okay, so there he is there, there's your man. Not somebody who's been remembered perhaps quite as much as he should have been, maybe it's because he didn't really go on to have a very big or significant solo career outside of Bowie, but the work he did with Bowie was, um, seminal would be a good word to describe it. So there we go, Mick Ronson is my last choice. So I'd be interested if anybody else has got any ideas. Great, but occasionally overlooked guitar players. And uh, that's it for now. I hope you're all well, and I'll see you very soon. Bye-bye. Silver in the park, ladies and gentlemen.